I'm uh, Anthony Flint. I'm a fellow and director of public affairs here at the Lincoln Institute. And I'm joined by uh, Greg Ingram, our president, and Armando Carbonell, who is senior fellow and chairman of the Department of Planning and Urban Form, uh, which has long been interested in regional planning and civic engagement uh, across jurisdictional boundaries and among multiple stakeholders. Uh, we have a recent book, uh, Regional Planning in America, and website subcenters on regional collaboration and uh, visioning and visualization, uh, which uses technology for uh, scenario planning and building consensus. So it's with great pleasure that we welcome George Thrush, uh, director of the School of Architecture at Northeastern University, who has developed something he calls the Urban Gauge. Uh, a flexible web-based software tool designed to inform and engage multiple stakeholders in the urban planning uh, decision-making process. This idea is important because while major development projects of course have a regional context, the discussion tends to be very local. Uh, one might even say as local as a butter's backyards. I've known George for many years, and uh, during my time as a journalist, recall being impressed with his dedication to the idea of the urban ring, uh, circumfer uh, circumferential transit corridor around Boston that would connect the spokes of the, uh, uh, the hub uh, uh, for better access to um, job centers uh, from, from uh, existing housing. Uh, that's just one of the many initiatives that uh, has been the focus of his uh, work and uh, his uh, de design solutions for uh, what he calls Boston's post-industrial landscape of former transportation infrastructure and other difficult sites. His research practice, writing, and teaching all revolve around contemporary urban issues in architecture and the connections among transportation, urban design, and civic image uh, in an increasingly privatized economic arena. He was one of three recipients nationwide of the 1996 uh, AIA Young Architect Citation. His degrees are from the University of Tennessee and Harvard University's Graduate School of Design. And in addition to running the architecture school with its laudable emphasis on practice, uh, he does something very special in my view, and that is he writes a blog for Boston Magazine. Uh, he'll speak for the customary uh, 50 minutes uh, and then take questions and discussion, moderated by Armando Carbonell. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome George Thrush. Thank you, Anthony, very much, and thank you all for coming. Um, this is really a, a, a great opportunity for me, and I really appreciate uh, being invited to join your, your lunchtime series. Um, as Anthony suggested, I have been interested in urban design for a long time. And um, because I grew up in Chicago, I didn't understand that there was such a difference between urban design as practiced by cities and urban design as practiced by regions until I moved here. And then I realized that um, the term that you hear most in Massachusetts is about the 300 and some odd cities and towns, not about any one sort of regional strategy. And um, that has been a stumbling block, I would say, to an enormous amount of regional thinking in this area. The fact that the that what we would normally, if you put a, a map of Chicago down uh, on top of Boston, just for example, the Boston metropolitan area, the mayor of Chicago would be mayor of about 70 cities and towns. <laughs> in other words, one person, one authority would be able to make enormous um, uh, inf influential uh, decisions about the region, which are just very, very difficult to make here. Um, so that's kind of how I uh, got attracted to this, uh, this side. You know, I'm trained as an architect, like a lot of people interested in urban design. I'm trained as an architect. Uh, but m most of my prof professional life, I would say, has been biased towards, uh, towards urban design. Um, let me just, uh, let's see if I can get this thing going. Here, just a moment. There we go, okay. Um, whoops. So at our school, um, which I started in early 1990s, um, we are also very interested in urban design. We've hosted Mayor's Institutes um, recently in 2009. 
working with the mayors of some small New England cities. Very interesting uh, because their problems, not surprisingly, were, were all very similar to one another. We've hosted, just in the last couple of years, uh, big conferences on infrastructure in the future, um, what role architects may play in this, because it's not at all obvious that architects will play a major role. <laughs> they may have once played a major role. It's not at all obvious that they'll continue to do so. Um, we produced publications on this sort of stuff. Pr had a great conference on prefabricated housing and the potential uh, for that in cities, in post-industrial cities, in some of these small um, economically distressed cities in New England. Uh, some of the mayors of small cities like Lewiston, Maine, were super interested in the idea that um, there is possibility for some of their um, uh, no longer used manufacturing capacity to be the place where some of this prefabricated housing could be built to then replenish uh, the housing stock in some of those places. So these, were, these are exciting conferences. If you know the firm Resolution for Architecture, Joe Tanney is a, uh, one, of the, one of the most interesting um, prefab housing designers out there today. Uh, we hosted a, another a conference on the intersection of typology as a sort of theoretical construct with the very real uh, notion of typolo building typology uh, as a real estate uh, taxonomy, which was, which was very interesting. Um, uh, Armando and Anthony and other, perhaps others in this room were involved in uh, a conference we held at the Colonnade Hotel just this past spring uh, called ominously The Process. And the process was entirely about um, the public review process as it has evolved since the 1960s to be perhaps the most uh, prescriptive element of the uh, building and design process that exists today. And this is the sort of thing that we look at at our school, which if you've seen the research topics at other architecture schools, you'll note this is not exactly typical. Our, our school has a, despite being a school of architecture, and now we also have a program in urban landscape, um, we are very focused on, on urban design and all, all that we do. What I am really here to talk to you about is this urban gauge planning tool. And this is something that has been occupying my mind for ooh, two or three, four years. Um, and the reason is that, as Anthony suggested, because I was uh, very involved in the, um, the project that you all know as the Urban Ring, which is known today as being kind of a, I don't know, a giant, unachievable, massive MBTA budget item never to be realized. Um, it, but it, it really is a, uh, I would say, a construct that could involve transportation, but could also involve a lot of other things. One of my net upcoming blog posts is about um, comparing the prospect of um, the High Line in New York as a, perhaps a model of success for the Urban Ring in Boston. That is, it is a, a way of adaptively reusing underutilized aging transportation infrastructure to greater civic benefit. Um, there are lots of differences, but there are lots of similarities too. Um, but I realized when, after articulating this urban ring idea extremely well, with many other people, by the way, but we hosted a lot of the events and published a lot of the materials on, on the urban ring, and I thought, wow, I was a young architect. I thought, this is so satisfying. It's a clear, well-articulated idea. Everybody I show it to in the planning and design professions thinks it's exactly the thing we should do. There were outside <laughs> people that came in assessing the future of Boston at various other schools, and they all said, the one thing you must do is build the urban ring. And I thought, wow, this is so cool. I'm going to live to see this. Well, needless to say, um, that didn't exactly happen. And one of the reasons it didn't happen is there is no regional entity to cause something like the urban ring to happen. Um, because we don't really make big planning decisions in this area. We make a series of small decisions. And it became clear to me um, that we need to find a way to link those small decisions together to, if we want to achieve any larger aims. And it seemed to me that development in this area, as again, as, as Anthony alluded to in his introduction, um, has three basic components when it comes to who has to approve of it. One are the local residents 
the, the abutters, the people who go to every meeting, the people who fear that they'll lose a parking space, the people who live in fear of shadow and so forth. Um, and then, of course, there's also a regional interest. But that regional interest, it might be, for example, that building additional housing downtown is in, enormously to the benefit of the region. But that regional interest uh, hardly ever has a seat at the table. Um, the third thing, of course, is the financial interest, which is basically <coughs> migratory capital. But any development project that you can think of is basically uh, sitting on those three legs local concerns, regional concerns, and the financial viability of the project. And so I set out to outline what the sort of performance criteria of a planning tool that helped at least allow people to see these three legs clearly, what, what, what that might be. And so what we started with was um, something that is abundantly clear, which is no project. And, if, and again, I should preface this by saying I have done my time. Okay, I have been the chairman of several CAC, community advisory committees, for major projects that take multiple years. I have been an advocate on the part of developers as a, as, as, as with them as my client. I have been hired or asked, not hired, <laughs> I wish hired. No, I have been asked to donate weeks of my time by the city uh, to chair one of these committees. So I've done it, I've, I've, done, I've been a participant in this process from both the public side and the private side, as I'm sure many of you have. And one of the things that's obviously crucial and <laughs> is nonetheless somewhat opaque in the public review process is um, financial viability. Um, now why? Because of course real estate developers don't want to tell you any of this. And they don't want to tell you um, it, it, how much money they're going to make on a project. Um, and I might suggest, and perhaps this is because I'm the son of a real estate developer in Chicago, full disclosure, but I might suggest that that's not really the issue. The issue is what are the public benefits of a project going to be? Whether the developer is going to make a lot of money or a little money isn't really the issue. The question is, is the project going to accrue to public benefit? But in order to be fair in any kind of full transparency system, and mind you, this idea is about communicating as transparently as possible what is going on in what is now a very opaque process. So even though I'm not sure I think it's really essential to this process, I think it is essential to, let's say, equilateral transparency to, to make um, uh, the financial underpinnings of uh, a real estate proposal uh, visible. So with the help of my friend Tim Love at Util, who is a, a great architect and also a member of our faculty at Northeastern, um, we developed a very simple modeling tool that might show the basic division of, let's say, um, you know, residential, commercial, and community spaces indicated here in yellow, red, and blue. And then some kind of simple financial barometer that says, at a certain height, this project is, is viable financially. And you can cut off a couple of floors here, and it'll still be. But then below that, it won't be. So just so you know, height, which is, as you know, the metric in, in much of uh, Boston's development, uh, uh, you know that there are, there are limits to what we can add and subtract here. So we developed this way of looking at the individual project with the hope of folding it into a local context and even into a regional plan so that we could give scores we could give scores on financial viability at, uh, of a project um, as, a, as an individual enterprise um, local scores in terms of how it benefited or detracted from the local environment and then regional scores uh, as to how it uh, improved or, or detracted from the region. So to do this, of course, uh, since I'm not a computer programmer, um, I uh, was working um, with uh, a, uh, a woman named Irene Wong, and um, she helped me to put together the sort of um, web-based underpinnings of a crude first stab at this idea. And let me just explain to you what we're trying to do. Um, 
it, it essentially has um, two parts. It has a what you might call the regional and local dashboard, this top portion. And the bottom portion has to do with the individual project. And let me just show you a little bit more here. And what, 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 is it, what do I mean by um, you know, large scale metrics? Well, there are uh, lots of things, as we know, that um, cross municipal boundaries in, in the Boston area. Um, you know, turnpike air rights can do that. Certainly the urban ring can do it. Transit oriented development or smart growth strategies are all things that can cross uh, local boundaries and, and become regional issues. Um, and obviously there are large scale regional needs or goals that we might have. Um, again, I don't think there's anything here that's particularly controversial. Um, well, I shouldn't say that. Everything is controversial these days, but um, Let's say in, in, in this state, I don't think that there's a lot uh, on this uh, that is particularly controversial, that uh, uh, altering auto and transit use, uh, or at least being able to scenario plan around what changes um, in the built environment might uh, uh, be caused uh, with regard to auto and transit use. Um, energy use and efficiency, uh, increased access to pu public amenities and so forth, and economic uh, competitiveness. All of these are, are regional, uh, uh, needs. But as I said before, it, it's one thing to talk about these regional needs, but we don't make large-scale decisions. We actually make a series of small ones. And this is the fundamental reality underlying this, this uh, tool. You know, I, I suppose, you know, our friends in Europe are changing to become a bit more like we are, like we are now, but, but, you know, the Netherlands of 20 years ago probably wouldn't have needed uh, a tool like this because they would have a, a strong regional planning authority with the ability to actually instigate projects that could meet large regional needs. Um, since we don't have that, we have to try to find a way to use some sort of jujitsu to get the smaller projects to add up to uh, regional benefit. So how do we make small scale projects um, reflect our larger scale goals? And the hope is that this urban gauge uh, interface is a way to start thinking about this. And I, I, I am the first to say, number one, this is a, you know, whatever comes before beta is what this is. Um, this is. This is an outline of an idea um, that needs uh, uh, technical development. Um, and, uh, uh, but I think you'll be able to understand uh, what we're talking about here. Um, let me get into this. It, it, it links um, regional measures to local measures. And you might say, okay, well, let's, let, let's just talk about that for a second. Um, local issues, obviously, can be very, very different from regional ones. If you say at the macro scale, we want to be, we want to enhance our economic competitiveness and we want to uh, be more energy efficient and so forth. Um, the, at the local scale, um, things can be very, very different. For example, if you just think about Chelsea on the one hand and Brookline on the other. Um, you know, Brookline right now, um, one of the most important issues in Brookline is to not uh, park on the street overnight. That's, <laughs> that's a very compelling issue in Brookline. Um, um, in Chelsea, they'd be happy to have another 10,000 uh, people move there tomorrow. They'd love it. Um, their concerns are very, very different. Their local concerns are very, very different from the people in Brookline. And so it's important to have a way of distinguishing um, what matters most to local communities um, and, and, and then measuring that against regional issues. Now, you might say, well, uh, well but who wins in that, in, that, in that battle? I think all we can ask for a tool like this to do is more clearly show um, how a, a project uh, uh, that is proposed, how it works against regional needs versus the local needs where it is. And I, I, something along the lines of giving such projects a score um, seems to us a, 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 a very good idea. Of course, along with that comes real-time visualization so that whenever you're proposing a project, you're seeing um, a, a, an image of it in, in real time. You're seeing it in, in situ. 
Now, uh, just a little bit about, uh, I, you know, I'll be over my head in two seconds here, but just uh, the basic idea is that, that, is that there is a client and a server, and that the, the, all the stuff we've been talking about up to now is on the client side. The server side is what takes advantage of the fact that we live in this so-called Web 2.0 era, where there's an enormous amount of real-time data available so that things like um, um, the costs of materials, the price of development can be reasonably um, uh, simulated, along with transit use and all the other variables that we know would go into such a thing. And these things exist in all kinds of repositories, uh, census, housing survey. There's just, there, every day there's more repositories of this kind of data. The, what there isn't enough of are tools that cross-reference and link it. And that's what the, the Urban Gauge would hope to do. Um, I'm sure you guys are, are, many of you are familiar with the Boston Indicators Project, which already uh, uh, disseminates a lot of this kinds of material, a lot of this kind of data. So, you know, if you look at it um, from the standpoint of, let's say, starting with six broad categories of regional issues, environmental sustainability, regional urban form, economic health, housing supply and affordability, education, public life, and transportation efficiency, um, you can then break down a number of metrics to those things. You can break down a number, you know, what would I measure um, to, to um, come up with scores in these areas? And you'll notice um, a second from the bottom there, beautiful walkable communities for those um, advocating for same. Um, uh, but you know, that, that, there, that there are numbers that one can um, start to put on these things and you know, the, the, the uh, smart growth uh, people have already started to try to synthesize this material as I'm sure many of people in this room are more familiar with than I am. But the idea that you integrate lots of this kind of data to get a basic score well, imagine there being an environmental sustainability score for a given project. So, um, and now this is going to this gets into stuff that is 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 important, but I, I but it, it's not I, probably central to this conversation, which is, you know. You'd obviously have to. It depends on how much you want to drill down into um, coming up with good numbers for these. Uh, various regional qualities, but it's very doable. I mean, all this information is, is accessible, and the idea that you can link into it in real time makes this tool one that would uh, constantly change as circumstances change. And, you know, the, the, the variables here are, 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 are clear, and how you would arrive at the metrics, I think, are clear. Uh, now, now we're getting to some of the language that um, uh, uh, my colleague used to communicate to the to the programming people. Uh, uh, so semantic modeling is, is is her term and not mine, but uh, the idea that you can cross-reference these things to to come up with with scores. But then the the other key thing is, of course, this individual project plug-in. The idea that um, and the way we talked about this originally, and I still think it's a good idea, um, is that this software might have two basic parts. One part that is used by cities or regulatory agencies, and then another part that is used by developers to plug into it. And that they would then, and of course, in the age of BIM software and data heavy modeling software, this is easier than ever to consider. Uh, it's, it's even easier than when we first started talking about this because almost everybody is developing a project in a data-rich environment. But the idea that any developer would have to propose their project in a form that could be plugged into this modeling tool. Um, this is just, this, and just as an example of how something like this would work. Um, this is, uh, let's say, a vision of the project as it is currently uh, proposed. And, but after the community meeting, the first meeting, people say, well, no, 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 that's totally unacceptable. You have to cut off five floors. And if you've been to it, this is exactly how the meeting goes. And, um, uh, and so now um, it's, not, uh, it, it's not economically viable. But not to worry, we can keep it low and we'll add 
some commercial space, and now we're back into the, into the uh, profitability zone. Um, but uh, then we added some uh, community space that brought it out of uh, 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 viability. So we added two of the five floors back on, and now this is where we are. Well, you might say this is a kind of an idealized scenario, but in fact, if everybody in the public review process were accountable in a fact-based environment, and if you've been to these, the, 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 if you participated in the public review process, you're often allowed to sort of make up your own facts. And, and so that has a tendency to extend the process uh, enormously. If the, if the consequences of your proposal when you raised your hand and said, this is what I think needs to happen, were visible in real time, imagine how much shorter this process could be. Now, I would interject here briefly that um, the, the, the conference that we hosted at the Colonnade Hotel this past spring uh, that, that Armando and Anthony participated in, um, um, unfortunately, Cairo Shen, the director of planning for Boston, was not there. But I do know what he would have said, which is, well, George, this is really interesting, and you're right. This would be much more efficient. But the part you don't understand is it's supposed to take two years. This is just something to do for two years because the political process takes two years. So we could play jacks or cards. <laughs> we instead prefer to um, talk about the project for two years because that's how long it takes for us to kind of make the have the debates and private conversations with stakeholders to make the process work. I don't have an answer for that. Um, <laughs> if, if that's true, if, it ha if it's not going to make the process any shorter, and of course there would be enormous benefit to our society for this process to be shorter. Um, economic benefit, uh, uh, it, it would be much better if we didn't have such obstacles to good quality development. But if it does have to take this long, I still think having a transparent um, representation of interests in development would just be a good thing in its own right. In other words, it would be, it would be a, a, a public benefit by itself, even if it doesn't speed up the process. So there it is. Everybody's happy. Um, and that only took us about five minutes. Um, and you know, how would this happen? Well, it really it, it wouldn't be super complicated. Um, when we talked with developers about um, this, and of course they all said, well, it's very interesting, but we would never tell you anything about our economic facts. The truth is in the Web 2.0 era, that's OK. You don't have to tell us. We will simply use what, we, what our uh, sort of comp costs. We will just use, if you can do it, um, if, if we will make a, 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 a simplified pro forma for your project. And if, you're actually, if your real pro forma does better than that, well, more power to you. This is the one we're going to use as the basis for this process. And we'll use the same one for everybody. In other words, we'll use the same cost structure for everybody. And in a way, that's probably, that's probably even better than people giving us customized uh, information. Um, and of course, to go back to this point, this is what the real strength of this thing would be, is to link um, what are now pretty disparate conversations. Uh, now, the person who was really interested in this when he first started talking about this was Greg Bilecki, uh, the Secretary of uh, uh, Housing and Economic Development, because he saw and agreed right away that they don't really have a way of evaluating a project in, you know, uh, I don't know, in, in Methuen versus a, a project in, in, in uh, Framingham and a project in uh, um, uh, uh, Braintree um, in aggregate or how they would influence the larger regional uh, uh, benefits that for which the state is responsible. So he was very interested in this um, and he will still be interested in this if we can ever get um, the technical uh, prowess to, to complete it. Um, so uh, you know, this is the this is the, the the picture of the thing as it exists, um, with uh, uh, the the project plug-in area, the um, local area indicators. In this case, you know, uh, 
Roxbury versus Chelsea versus, versus uh, Brookline, um, and then the regional indicators. And the idea that every project could get uh, a score then. So the public benefits, uh, as I've alluded to, are, the, uh, are a faster public review process. But even if that's not true, um, or even if that's not as desirable as I think it is on the political side, um, uh, an improved measurement of progress on important issues, I think, is, 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 is to everybody's benefit. I cited as an example my colleague Barry Bluestone at the Dukakis Center for Urban and Regional Policy at Northeastern um, produces an annual housing report card that simply provides the facts on a given year, um, uh, the, has the housing supply grown or uh, been reduced, what are the costs, and so forth. And that transparency is simply a useful thing to know. It becomes the basis for other uh, work. Um, I, I also think, as a, you might say, well, as an architect, how did you wade into this? If the public review process actually focused more on design quality and less on these um, metrics that we can actually um, put a real number to, I think we would get better design. And so I think that there is a uh, there is an architectural interest underlying all this that is that, um, you know, if you go to a public review meeting now, I just chaired the Citizens Advisory Committee for um, a bunch of new development that's going to go up at uh, the Christian Science Center Plaza. Uh, I don't know if you all are aware that they're going to build almost a million square feet down there. Not to worry, it's not going to be on the plaza. It's on some land they own behind. But... Um, you know, that process was, was uh, almost entirely about height and bulk and nothing about quality. Not a word about quality. And that's distressing to me. <laughs> and we see the evidence of that kind of decision making all the time. Um, if everybody is convinced that the only thing that matters is, are, are these quantitative measures, let's make the quantitative measures more visible. Um, let's present them more clearly and more factually. Um, you know, where a building casts a shadow ought not be a matter of opinion. <laughs> it's a matter of fact, okay? <laughs> I mean, that, that should not be something that people have different opinions on in a meeting. There, it, it is what it is. Um, and so if we can concentrate a bit more on, now, I may not like the outcomes of uh, a, public, a public meeting devoted entirely to architectural quality, but I think it is, uh, it is a more appropriate topic. Um, you know, who would use uh, something like this? Obviously, uh, planning agencies, municipal governments, so, but also community leaders and advocates, real estate developers. And, um, you know, it seems to me that a, a, a university or, uh, or other not-for-profit institution might be the sort of keeper of the, of the website. You know what I mean? Somebody has to be wearing the, the, the referee's striped shirt in these kinds of debates, and I think that uh, it, might be, it might be somebody like us. Um, so you might say, gosh, this, uh, the, all the computing companies around here, they must be chomping at the bit for this. That's what I would have thought too, because you know I saw their ads about IBM and the Smarter City project and so forth. But the truth is, um, we have, uh, we, we, we've, we've talked with IBM and uh, it may be that the um, digital world is simply changing faster than I am aware of. I don't make any claims to being a, a, a programming type, but um, you know it's becoming ever more disaggregated and less centralized with mobile devices and so forth. So we're working on a, a, another simultaneous angle, which is um, to develop an application at Northeastern for iPads that allows you to see a proposed building um, before it's built in context because you have GPS which locates your device and you're looking down the street, you see the world as it is, but then you look at the screen and you see the building or buildings that are proposed in real time. And this empowers individual people to, to come to that realization. And maybe there's a little bit of interface um, uh, Within it, uh, these are these are little screenshots. This this technology already completely exists. Uh, the Netherlands Architecture Institute has a device called the UAR. It's a little app uh, for uh, smartphones, um, and 
you can do this right now in the Netherlands. You can go and you can look, by the way, um, into the future, but also into the past. So you see, you look at the West End, and you see what was once there. Um, you know, it's an interesting tool for empowering people to understand their city or their region as evolving through time and not as stayed and fixed, which might be also a good thing in, in, in principle. Um, so that we are, we're, we're, um, we're pursuing this simultaneously. I think there's probably a place for both kinds of tools. That is a more mainframe based, database driven big tool for a municipality or a regional government or something like that. Um, that has plugins for individual projects, but also a tool like this to um, encourage a wider range of, of civic participation. What if you didn't have to go to the public meeting, but you could evaluate the project on your way home from work? I, I think that might be a very attractive thing. But uh, that's it. That's what we're working on, and I thank you very much for your time. So this has interest in terms of uh, a tool and for the technical aspect of how you put it together. I think there's some people here who will want to talk to you about that. But there are also some policy uh, uh, aspects that I find interesting. And the way you frame this is a, a kind of uh, multi-stakeholder negotiation. You've right. got local interest and regional interest. You've got the, uh, uh, the owner of the land or the developer uh, who has an interest. And you have information. And, uh, and it may not be perfect because the, uh, the owner of the land or the developer may hold back some of that, but then you have a, a, a sort of a proxy for right. it. Now, this could come out in a lot of different ways, right? Uh, and, and I think you show a happy outcome right. Right. that I think is based on the assumption that uh, everybody wants the project to happen. Right. Now, uh, it, it seems to me there may be circumstances under which somebody doesn't want the project sure. to happen, in which case uh, it, it won't be quite so happy. Uh, but also that in some environments, there's more ability to meet community uh, uh, aspirations and be profitable, and, and in others less so. So I, I remember uh, talking to a former uh, planning director in uh, San Francisco back when that was a really hot city, and they did this kind of analysis on every project that came in, and then they said, and we kind of like that chunk of profit to come back to us. Right, and they right. found ways to, uh, to exact it. And so their, their way of doing uh, contributions from developers was to sort of do their own financial analysis of the project and figure out what would not kill the project, but would maximize the community return. So they're sort of tussling over that, uh, that margin or that increment. So I just, could you comment a little bit on yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, no, that that's plays a, out in this context? First of all, let's stipulate that Boston and San Francisco are probably, at least over the last 25 years, the places that are most, um, uh, where, 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 where this uh, has the most legs. Because Akron and Detroit, you know, people are not fighting over development there. So this is, ba this is fundamentally about contested places where it's contested. And so San Francisco and, and, and Boston, where, the, where there's scarce land, uh, high value real estate and so forth, are, are, are perfect examples. But of course, you're absolutely right that like any tool, this could get used to uh, myriad ends. I mean, having a tool like this is not going to change the perspective of somebody who thinks it's morally or politically wrong for a real estate developer to extract more than a certain amount of uh, profit from the land. That's a, I agree. Uh, but, I, but I think that, uh, you know, in the hierarchy of wrongs that exist in the process today, the lack of transparency about what's going on, what the interests are, is as grave as anything because you know, in, in Boston, I mean, a place where I know a lot of the players, <laughs> and you'd think I would be reasonably up on <laughs> what's going on. Others, I have much better access than the average person. Um, I'm often mystified at decisions that get made because um, we don't know. We don't know enough information. And so I think it's in the public interest in the same way that sort of general transparency is in the public interest. And then it does become a question of, uh, of political choice as to how that gets used. But I would, 
I can see how reasonable people could say, you know, look, it may not be perfect now, but actually, I mean, for example, the Boston Redevelopment Authority actually operates very well, I think, in many w ways right now. I mean, they have they exercise very good judgment in a lot of cases and probably maybe better than uh, plebiscite, <laughs> right? Be careful of, to, of, of how much democracy you ask for because you might get it and you could get California where you get, you know, a hundred ballot initiatives uh, every election cycle. And I don't know if people think that's actually yielded uh, better government. But, but I do think that on the built environment, and especially for my money, the part that really comes up short here, as Anthony alluded to at the beginning, is the regional interest. That is the part that fundamentally, for lots of reasons here, but mostly because we're composed of so many discrete localities, the regional interest does not get shown. And if that were shown, at least it would provide political cover for people to make, I think, better decisions on the per project basis. So just a little follow up, and I, I won't dominate after this. No, uh, sure. But that regional interest and also the possibility that uh, between the regional interest and the developer's interest, there may be some ability to compensate the local uh, loss uh, to the extent it, and the idea of the community benefit agreement and sure. other ways of <clears throat> very much localizing some compensatory uh, uh, benefits that, that would in some way neutralize some of that. I, I completely agree. You know, Matt Kiefer, uh, our, our friend Matt Kiefer at Goulston Stores, wrote a great piece a couple of years ago about the reality that, you, you know, um, local abutters uh, hear a lot of grief for being overly contentious. But his point was, actually, sometimes these projects really do impose costs on them that need to be acknowledged. And I think your point is, is very well taken. This would be a clearer way of providing the, uh, the political and economic context for those negotiations to, uh, for them to occur in. Okay, so we're gonna open it up at this point. Yes, all the way down. Um, I'm sorry, this question is uh, a bit naive. I'm not familiar with this, how the software works, but I'm curious as to how the, the first program you showed, the, the big database, right, right, right. how that gauges the public interest. Um, it, are you asking people to vote and sort of provide feedback in the set of indicators for what their local priorities are and then what their regional priorities are and then asking them to come back and vote on a particular project and how it measures against the community developed indicators? Or is this kind of a more top-down set of things that the government says is valuable? Uh, here's the way we envision it. And by the way, it, there is no way that it is right now. There is only a, a road map to, you know, you guys are, 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 are catching me partway through a process that I hope will yield a, a, a very functional uh, tool. But the way that this is outlined right now is that, yes, a community would vote or if, through whatever means, through a, a, a redevelopment authority holding meetings, absent a project, but saying, you know, this is what uh, Roxbury thinks are the most, are, th these are how we're ranking our, our biggest priorities. This is how Brookline does. This is how Chelsea does, et cetera. And yes, that, that I mean, in my experience, having people um, articulate what they care about most first before the project is on the table is vastly superior to the, uh, to the alternative. In other words, vastly superior to get people on record as saying these are the things that we value so that if you satisfy those things, that should, that should count for something. So I, I wouldn't say, no, it is not envisioned that they would then necessarily vote on the project, rather that a project would get a score based on and it's the, those, the, their, their ranking of things needn't, ex, needn't be the case forever. Maybe it changes, Maybe there's a, a, a meeting every year to revisit what our local priorities are. But if those are articulated, and then we have the more, frankly, a little bit easier to articulate regional ones, a project can get a score for how it measures against each, each of these. And of course, the, the easiest thing to score maybe is the economic viability against our um, faux approximation of what uh, the cost should be. But the idea is that we triangulate in there. And if you're, if you're doing terribly on the regional side 
and you're offending local sensibilities, it's pretty hard to see how you would have a high enough score for the project to be able to proceed. That, that's the idea. Yes? Any project that is not going to return some economic benefit to the local community is not going, is not going to get approval, particularly now when these local municipalities are so cash strapped that they're having to reduce that's, public services. That's a totally so, great point. And I think that you need to get that into your calculation. Well, but see, it is, it is in as one of those, you could rank um, economic return to the municipality as one of your top scores on your local list. But just to, why am I picking on Brookline? It's not fair, but they're, they're, you know, Brookline or Cambridge might say, actually, Economic return is not our top thing. We're doing fine, let's say. And Chelsea might say, you know what? Um, economic return is number one for us, or job creation, or something like that. And if it casts a shadow, so be it. But the point is that the different communities could, uh, at least according to this outline, could rank their priorities differently. The land value in all of these communities is created by the public. and. It, by public investment is what increases okay. land value. Um, if public you won't get any arguments around here. Yeah. Oh, I, I, okay. I, you know, through school. Just pretend I'm Elizabeth Warren, okay? <laughs> but, but, we we but, don't have a fight. But, but that, no. that, that, that a way to return that to the locale. Okay, but just, I, 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 I don't, but, but let's be clear. This is the whole thing, the whole engine, the intellectual engine to develop this tool is precisely not to presume that there is a kind of regional righteousness that is going to make good stuff happen. Rather, that we have to have, we have to recognize that for-profit actors are the ones who are going to be doing this stuff. And so we need to make a machine that best approximates the kind of civic outcomes that you aspire to. Okay. As you were describing it, and, and as you gave kind of the uh, example of uh, what uh, Cairo Shen might say, mm -hmm. um, it, it struck me that, that this as a tool could be very useful in a, how do I describe it nicely, in, in a sort of a situation where there's an absence of planning. In other mm -hmm. words, projects are negotiated right. case by case, side by side, and so you need these, <coughs> right? You, you right. contextualize it with this base of, or a broad band of constituencies and interests to go into the quantitative calculation. Uh, I'm one, so I'm, I'm just wondering, um, at a planning scale, what, what some of your thinking is in terms of how this may uh, instigate, because to the, to the answer to the earlier question, how do you get the community values into it? What you were describing to me is sort of the function of planning, right? Mm -hmm. You say, where do we want, right. what, do we, what do we have a vision for our community? And those become the starting points of the conversation for evaluating projects right. after that. So, well, I guess the great thing about trying, I mean, the reason that I guess I got drawn to doing this in Massachusetts and wouldn't have maybe in Chicago is the need for it in Chicago is much less. Even though Chicago is a contested place also, it's not as contested here, but it also has a much more functioning planning operation because it has the necessary regional scope built in. Um, in other words, because it's such a big city. Um, here, uh, everything is non-conforming. Nothing is as of right. Everything is contested. Um, I mean, you're, it's a good point about, well, but then where does the regional agenda come from? And I, the ones I listed, you'll, you might note, notice, are, are kind of modest, smart growth principles, or um, the urban ring, which is a, you know, which would have some more specific perform. I, I included that because it could have some more specific form-based performance uh, criteria, right? Like tall things here, but not here. Um, but uh, I mean, it's a very good point. This is not going to give of a, a disaggregated region like this part of Massachusetts a regional agenda simply by its existence. It is going to maybe be able to help it meet a few basic regional goals. Maybe prompt interest in actually. Uh, yeah, maybe. 
How do you reconcile the ranking system if the political system is against the higher ranked solutions? And the second one is, uh, can this apply to infrastructure projects as well uh, in terms of ranking of benefits? Um, I know we have this elaborate NEPA process for all infrastructure projects, uh, but nothing quite like this that really um, uh, sort of computerizes the benefits and costs of a particular solution. Uh, would, would it apply equally? For well, I think, I think actually that would be a great example of a way to use something like this, would be if you're proposing a widening of a, a, widening of a highway or uh, or, or any kind of infrastructural change like that. I mean, take a, 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 another example, um, transit-oriented development. If we're going to develop these four nodes along this uh, transit line, um, you know, this is a regional, the regional benefit is that we're going to get, we think, actually there's evidence now that cuts both ways on this, but we think more people out of cars because the people who live there will, will take the train into, into the city and so forth. Um, uh, so that's a regional benefit, but then what are the local trade-offs for what had been a sleepy hamlet, which is now going to become a much denser place? I, I, sure. I mean, I think, I, I mean, what this really is, well, all it is, is, as you can see, is an outline about trying to identify what the correct intersection of interests is. Because I think a lot of the processes we have spring from an incorrect what I would call an incorrect or in, a, a not accurate, not um, sufficiently representative uh, uh, set of, of variables, or excessive, to be more specific, that are excessively focused on the local and the financial at the expense of the regional. I mean, I'm not the only one who thinks this, but. What is the higher ranking that the community wants? Um, it's, a great, it's a great. Here and it, how does it, what if it conflicts with what the politicians Well, I mean, that's a good point. But, but I, on the other hand, I, what, would, uh, what would be clearer to the political class than an extremely transparent um, expression of the community will on these, var these variables? Do you know what I'm saying? I, I, I mean, well, of course. No, oh, I mean, let me, uh, let me stipulate that. Of course, the current, if we're going to talk about Boston, the current system of everything being ad hoc, nothing being subject to the rule of law, really, and everything being at the mayor's discretion does accrue to a particular person's benefit. Uh, the mayor has enormous discretionary power, which is excellent in the political system. I don't pretend that people just give things like that up for no reason. That doesn't mean that that is necessarily in the public good. And as a, a college professor with tenure, it is my job to uh, at, at least provide some public good. And that's what I'm trying to do. So who would be the keeper of this tool? Who would, as I understand it, one of the things that I think you're advocating for is regional planning and that this tool gets you a couple of major steps towards regional planning. Let's take a greater Boston area. What entity might be the keeper of this tool, the user of this tool? Um, well, it's a great, I mean, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, I think my short answer is, um, I think universities are the perfect institution that cross boundaries. You know, we don't have, you know, maybe a consortium of, a, Universities, but this is how other data, to be fair, is managed. That that is, is supposed to remain neutral or as neutral as can be. Um, you know, it would be it would be the whoever keeps it has to not have a horse in the race, right? In other words, whoever keeps it has to be. And I, I see you th throwing up your hands. Everyone has a horse. Harvard has such a <laughs> I know, that's what I'm stable horses in the race. Mm. <laughs> Yes, yes. So, as one of the Senate candidates will find out, yeah. South Boston doesn't consider Harvard right. to be part of the community. Well, I too could throw up my hands and say, then perhaps I shouldn't go to work every day, but I do. I mean, in other words, sure, of course there, 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 there are conflicts, but I mean, faced with a choice of what um, 
uh, what entities ought to keep this. In other words, if somebody, if, if this is a, a thing worth doing, um, maybe it should be the public library. Except why, that's, why not at MAPC? Well, OK, sure. Maybe it maybe at MAPC. Of course, that'd be fine. Um, uh, you know, uh, it's true that um, uh, it might be a fabulous thing to have MAPC perhaps in conjunction with some, uh, with some other institutions. But, I, but I, of course, that would be great. It needs to be something that isn't a party to one particular town and that doesn't have, it isn't funded solely by NIOP or, or any of these other uh, operations. Um, not too much anyway, <laughs> or at least gets funding from a variety of sources. Um, I mean, I think the hope is that it be reasonably, uh, you know, it, it be as transparent uh, and as, 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 as neutral as, is, as it is possible to be. There's a big literature on uh, public interest in politics. Uh, the first person I read a long time ago was V.O. Key, who wrote a book about this. But the, the notion is that in the United States, if you have 100 people who are, for whom a decision is going to each cost each of them $10,000, it's a million dollars worth of cost, and you've got a million people, each of whom are going to benefit for $5, $5 million worth of benefits, Inevitably, the, the small group of people who have a lot to lose have a way of prevailing. Mm -hmm. and, and there's, there's not only a, a literature about that, but so everybody's nodding, saying, yeah, that sounds familiar. Mm -hmm. and, and so there, there is a problem, there is a public interest uh, problem that lies behind the notion that local opponents who are going to bear a lot of costs might prevent something happening at the regional level which would produce a lot of benefits at the regional level, but those benefits are diffuse and they're, they're, they're small per person, but they might add up to a very big number. So that, that's something that, that you want to think about in, the, in this context. Uh, the, this, the second comment that goes the other way is we've, uh, we've been talking about this issue about, but, but in a different context. It's more in the context of to what extent does the size of the jurisdiction affect regional outcomes? And it turns out, you. There's a little bit of empirical work about this where in Massachusetts, the land uh, control decisions are made largely at the level of towns of which there are 351 in Massachusetts. If you go to a state like Maryland, the land use decisions are made at the county level, uh, which is a substantially higher level. And so you can look at how do the mechanisms differ. And some of the empirical work suggests that as you make the unit of control larger, business interests become more powerful relative to residential interests. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and, and so what you're getting is not necessarily a regional view, but what you're getting is a different, mm. uh, you know, a different proportionality in terms of the power and the decisions that are made at the county level. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, you know, it's hard to imagine a private company coming in and really kind of taking over Lincoln, mm -hmm, you know, the mm -hmm. town board of Lincoln, which is where the residents are always going to control mm -hmm. that. Whereas once you move to, to a larger entity, to a metropolitan area and so on, then you have you know, business groups coming in and, and starting to, to you know, sure, advertising sure. campaigns and so on and so forth. So, so s s some of these uh, outcomes at the regional level that you may be seeing in Chicago may come out of political processes that produce what you might think of as, as better regional outcomes, and they may, may actually be better regional outcomes, but that may reflect a, a different kind of political process. Mm -hmm. and, and so as I said, there's the sort of public interest literature is, is, is kind of depressing mm -hmm. in terms mm -hmm. of your story. But this, this work that we've done uh, looking at jurisdiction size suggests that there, there's something to it. And then by the, the papers by Bill Fischel from Dartmouth, who mm -hmm. uh, has, has, it's a working paper here on our website looking at this issue. The, I think there's scope for more empirical work mm -hmm. on this and, and also more Un unraveling what what the stories are, you know, what, what what exactly are the mechanisms that lead to different outcomes, and so on. And so I I, would, I encourage people to to continue. This this is a little different from what you're doing, but mm -hmm. but basically, uh, I I think that your work needs to, might, might benefit from b being paired up with some of this empirical work, looking at how how is it this juri jurisdictional size affects outcomes. I, I think that's a really important and little studied problem. In well, I, I think it's, those are excellent points. Um, but, but they also, they, they do point to a, um, 
I, I guess in a way, almost an existential choice about something like this, which is, um, on the one hand, it's very tempting, because I've been involved in the actual review process of actual projects with actual outcomes, to say, God, I would love to have something like this become the mechanism by which such decisions are made. But then you get into the m morass, uh, in a way, that you're describing. Another option is perhaps more achievable, and that is, again, I, I, I think of my friend Barry Bluestone's uh, work where they simply put out and, and shine a bright light on facts. And, and it might be that this is a, if this can be done in a way that um, um, isn't in a way, because, it, because it's not the actual decision-making process, it is simply a depiction of the interests in a way that is more transparent than exists. Perhaps that's an easier thing to achieve and perhaps something that is best housed at a university. Um, do you know what I'm saying? Because it's, a, yeah. it's, a, it, 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 it's an ongoing research project. But, that's a, but, they're, but they're very different things and, and I think it's, a, it's an excellent point. I remember you mentioned MHC, and I was wondering what you thought of the Metro Future Plan and the Community Biz software for illustrating um, changes in regional priorities. For example, you, know, you adjust a level of spending on something, and then it shows you how that would be, how that would actually look, right. and so on. I, I think that's great. I think that's great. I think all these abilities to synthesize. Um, more than one input and come up with a, a, a visible outcome are hugely uh, beneficial. All we need to look at are, um, uh, Anthony and I were talking briefly about zoning, which is, a, you know, it's very easy to poke fun at this, but, but I mean, there are so, um, zoning is always written, almost always written in such a way that it is so difficult to envision what the outcomes will be that it is always great when, and one of the great one of the great transformative features of new urbanism is the idea of visualizing the formal consequences of policy. So I think that MAPC business is excellent, but I don't think it has enough, I think there are more inputs that would make it more interesting than simply if we spend more money, this is what we could get, but, but you know, that gets into some of these competing interests. George, I think this is really interesting. I'm also though, interested in the, you have all this hard data that you can input, but I'm also sort of interested in, in the soft <clears throat> parts that, that are involved with um, you know, debating whether a project should go forward sure. or not. So you know, I think a lot of the times when you talked about Cairo saying how you know, they want it to take two years, I think that they think that's how much time it, it, the community needs to just voice their opinions. Sure, sure. And so would there be a way for the community to sort of, you know, calculate just how they feel about something or, you know, in, and then to have that data also be reflected out in a transparent way so that, to Greg's point, if all of the opposition is coming from a corner of a street and yet the rest of the region would really love it, that that could be reflected back to everybody. Yeah, you know, <coughs> yes, I mean, I think it's, it's, uh, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of holes in this idea. One of them is there's a lot of good things about urban life that are difficult to quantify, for sure. I mean, when you think about, let's say, you're, let's say we're in the same community and we decide, when we're at the meeting that is going to decide uh, Cambridge's list of priorities, and um, we're going to say walkable streets. Okay, I'm, a, I'm for that. Um, then exactly what kind of score are we going to, is this going to have to do with Sidewalk width, shade, distance from buildings. You know, the minute you start quantifying that, you can immediately cite hideous examples that would meet each one of those criteria. So I don't pretend, especially on that's actually the hardest from my perspective. That's the hardest thing to quantify in this little decision making engine, or at least clarifying tool, is the closer you get to uh, to uh, quality of experience issues at the local level, the harder it is to quantify. Not surprisingly, for those of, who's, those of us who have studied design, you know, if it were, we'd, we'd be a lot faster at our work uh, if, 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 if that weren't the case. Um, I, uh, I was at, you've been presenting this as a, a tool for gauging um, proposed projects or, or planning decisions. I was wondering if you had ever thought about this as a tool that you could use to gauge 
just the quality of the urban environment over time, just as kind of as we yeah. as we live in it, because it's 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 always interesting and a little bit confounding just how um, how things change, both you know demographics and the the built environment, just attitudes change, lifestyles kind of change over time, and you end up in a lot of situations where um, you know a project that maybe people hate when it's being proposed, you know, 10 years later is, is everyone's favorite thing. So I guess the well, more frequently is, the opposite. But, or sometimes yeah. the opposite. And, when, and I guess the question is how do you, maybe the question is more how do you kind of factor time into, yeah. and, and how do you factor change yeah. into yeah. the yeah. equation? There's nothing about these inputs that is set in stone. I mean, the local ones could be done annually or whatever. I mean, there it seems to me there's probably a limit as to people do have other things to do um, than get together, you know, like weekly is probably too often um, to adjust the, uh, you know, the inputs. But, but sure, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, it's the sort of thing that could probably be done annually or even, I don't know, maybe even at a longer interval than that. The regional ones, I would argue, can actually be done almost in real time in a way, or at least the inputs to those can, are, are, are changing dynamically all the time. And that's why this sort of Web 2.0 environment is so cool about that. Like, for example, um, you know, and the financial ones are changing all the time. You know, the cost of building a steel frame building that's 60 stories tall is one thing in 2007 and another thing today. Um, and that's, it's a dynamic thing. And uh, so, I, uh, you know, as to the larger scope of your question that, you know, communities change and so forth, that's true. And in a way, this, this little iPad thing <laughs> is a better tool to address that, which I thought, I was really taken by the idea of something that not only allowed you to look at projects that are on the boards that might be built, but also to look down the street and see, I mean, who doesn't like to go to a restaurant and see the photos of Cambridge in the 1920s and think, wow, that just looked so different. Um, and it's, it's just interesting. Um, and it, it builds maybe a bit more of a sense that you're part of something that is changing rather than that every decision is, 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 is now and forever. Um, what I think is kind of fascinating about this is it, it, it starts to put these decisions into a context for communities and people, and, and also would then put an onus, give it, they'd be responsible for deciding what that vision is. So if you decided you didn't want parking on your streets right. in Brookline, you could say, OK, but that means you won't There's a lot of things that cascade from that. This other stuff. And we're never able to really plug in those things. It, it, somehow it seems like with the uh, lead things, you know, there's all these things for capturing your water and all that, but no one factors in these littler things, like how many cars come into that building mm -hmm. and that could actually have a larger mm -hmm. impact. So I, I think it, it, it's, it, it's an equalizer, but it would take a lot. And I bet people it would, um, community's idea would change when they saw what their choices I, well, get them. I, I, I completely agree with that. I mean, I, I, the one thing I've learned at being on a lot of these public process meetings is that um, I'm frequently flabbergasted by the, um, the notion that people can hold such opposing points of view in the same person at the same time, in the same place. I, it just blows my mind. And you know, it doesn't make any sense in a public context to say, sir, that is idiotic, what you just said, you know, because that doesn't advance the ball, but that is what one thinks. And so there is part of me that just wants there to be, uh, you know, if this, uh, this is like the alternative to what I have often called faith-based planning here in the Boston area, right? A, more of a fact-based planning. Yeah. Uh, on, on that note, uh, well, here, please correct. Okay, one more. Okay, one more. You just proposed quality and sustainability in one of your mm -hmm. narratives there. Yeah. Are they contrary to each other? Um, no, I shouldn't think so. I mean, I, I think they're, they're. I mean, look, lots of these things are. Um, um, you don't get all of one, and none of the other. I guess what the whole idea is to try to have accurate measures of the different choices that we face. So that as you dial up one and dial down the other, you understand what the consequences are. Um, and I, I just can't see how that wouldn't be a good thing as a, 
whether it would actually be the decision-making tool for choices about what gets built, or whether it would simply be a more factual backdrop um, is a reasonable, that's a reasonable question. But I do think that being able to see what the consequences of more of this or less of that are would accrue to, to a, a better public conversation. Okay, well, we'll close now, but George will remain for a while. Thank you. Thank you.